Thanks, everyone. Um, so just wanted to, before I uh, get started here, just wanted to acknowledge, you know, I'm privileged enough to work with indigenous Palestinians resisting a European settler state that was established on top of them in Palestine, right, the state of Israel, and want to just recognize how um, weird and, you know, just complex it is to be doing that work here in the United States, right, a much older and much more successful, uh, at least in terms of extermination of the indigenous population, European settler state. And so just want to acknowledge that, that as we're engaged in this conversation, um, that we're standing here on indigenous land, on occupied land um, of the Piscataway, the Nanticoke, and other uh, indigenous peoples who uh, predate the establishment through militarism, right, of this uh, United States here on indigenous land. Um, so, uh, so, and um, now I want to move on. What I'm going to just talk to for, talk to you all about for just a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the basics of the situation in Palestine, but rather since we're here at a divestment uh, campaign launch, want to talk just very quickly about what the BDS movement is. It's been referenced a few times already today, which is very exciting. Um, talk about what it is um, and then how we in the BNC, the Palestinian BDS National Committee, how we uh, look at various campaigns um, and think about how to prioritize resources um, because just like, uh, just like when thinking about divestment from the U.S. military industrial complex, um, we don't have the resources to do everything we want to do at the same time, so we need to think about priorities. And then I'll get into a few uh, possible joint targets um, that we might want to think about moving forward. Um, so very quickly, uh, the BDS movement, uh, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions movement, started on July 9th, 2005, over 12 years ago. Um, it was on that day that over 170 organizations uh, in Palestinian civil society, ranging from unions to women's groups to agricultural groups to student groups to all the various levels of Palestinian civil society, issued what's uh, known as the BDS call. Uh, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And what this was, was uh, modeled after the South African anti-apartheid struggle, as well as inspired by uh, the black freedom struggle in the US or the civil rights movement, um, a call to uh, international solidarity activists, those who wanted to stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine, to engage in the tactics of boycott, divestment, sanctions until three basic demands um, dealing with the three kind of divided segments of the Palestinian populations uh, come to be. And these demands are based on international human rights law. BDS is a, is a rights-based movement. Um, so the first being ending the occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall, what Palestinians generally call the apartheid wall inside the West Bank. Um, so this refers to the segment of the Palestinian population living under direct military occupation, those who live in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, um, and also includes actually the Golan Heights occupied uh, by Israel since 1967 from uh, Syria. Um, number two, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, that all citizens of Israel have equal citizenship instead of where it exists now, uh, which where Israel meets the international law definition of apartheid, which is that there are different classes of citizen uh, based on your identity. So Jewish citizens have rights um, and have laws that apply to them. Uh, that Palestinian citizens and, and other citi non-Jewish citizens of Israel do not have. Um, so uh, full equal rights and an end to uh, kind of the apartheid system inside of the state of Israel. And then thirdly, referring to actually the largest uh, percentage of the Palestinian population, unfortunately, the refugees um, who were created primarily in 1948 with the establishment of the State of Israel, but also uh, expanding in 1967. 
uh, when uh, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip were occupied, and that being that the right of return for all Palestinian refugees to their homes, to their indigenous lands. Um, today, there are over, well over four million Palestinian refugees um, who have never been allowed to return to their homes inside of the state of Israel from when they were ethnically cleansed, either in 48 or 67. Um, so BDS, um, boycott, right, uh, meaning uh, boycotting uh, Israeli consumer goods as well as consumer goods of corporations that are pr profiting and complicit from any of uh, these activities of occupation um, or inequality uh, that the state of Israel is carrying out. Divestment, right, what we've been uh, talking about all day today, but withdrawing uh, funds, generally um, looking at institutions, withdrawing institutional funds from targeted corporations. Um, one of the biggest examples of this, and I'll get to this, this uh, target a little bit more in a moment, uh, but one of the greatest examples right now uh, in the US um, is the HP Free Churches campaign targeting Hewlett Packard, a US-based corporation that's very involved um, in supporting what Israel is doing uh, in Palestine, um, where churches across the US are pledging uh, not only to take their funds out of uh, HP corporations, that actually split into two corporations, um, uh, but also uh, pledging not to buy HP products in their congregations. Um, and then sanctions being um, state, level, uh, uh, state level actions, uh, putting pressure on the state of Israel. One of the primary uh, focuses of the BNC in this regard um, is military embargo and cutting off uh, the weapons flow uh, to the state of Israel. Um, so, um, I need to move quicker. Um, just uh, to get into a little bit of the way that we think about um, when we look at, as I said, the like wide array of corporate actors um, that could potentially, uh, potentially be targeted by the BDS movement based on that criteria. How do we decide, right? We have a few criteria that I wanna share just as this, cam this campaign moves forward may be helpful uh, to think about. Um, one is how bad is the actor, right? Um, how you know horrible is what they're doing um, in Palestine? Uh, the reason that this is a criteria is because um, the worse the actor is, right, the more the mo the more we are able to mobilize support in response, right? And again, there's many, 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 many uh, uh, different entities that are complicit. Right, and so trying to think about how are we going to be most successful. One of those is how how bad are they, and how much support can we mobilize? Um, then uh, a, a strong uh, another strong criteria that we really think about is what is the potential to mobilize allies and build coalitions. Um, right, not just what they're doing in Palestine, but again, to use the HP example, right, has a history of working with ICE, is one of the largest military contractors, right, in the U.S. consistently for decades. Um, uh, and so how can we, uh, oh, and is also involved in prisons in the U.S., right? So how can we uh, look at these targets to think about mobilizing other constituents, constituencies, not just uh, BDS supporters, not just supporters of, of Palestinian freedom and liberation. And then thirdly, um, really thinking about the potential to win, right? We're not just doing this because it's the right thing to do. We actually want to win these campaigns, right? And so really thinking, one of the things we always do before launching a priority campaign is really think through what is the strategy going to be and how are we going to get from where we are to winning victories? Um, uh, not only thinking about how bad they are, not only thinking about um, who we can mobilize and support, but really thinking about how we're going to win. Um, uh, so, uh, and I will just uh, lastly add in that section that, that uh, on that strategy question and really thinking through that, 
research, 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 right? Like the more we know about our enemies, the more we know about the targets of these campaigns, the better we're able to shape this strategy, right? And of course that continues at, you know, as you move through campaigns, there's gonna be changes and, and uh, uh, ways of having to, to tweak your strategy depending on what these corporate targets and other targets end up doing and how they move in response to your campaign. Um, so just very quickly, I'm gonna name uh, a few possible common targets. One is that, of course, all five of the top five uh, US weapons manufacturers that were named, um, that are named as priorities in this campaign, of course, are very much involved with Israel. Israel's weapons you know, uh, industry is one of their uh, primary industries, uh, and both in terms of research and exporting, uh, uh, their own weapons as well. Um, and the US weapons manufacturers work very closely with that industry in Israel and have uh, institutions and research facilities, et cetera, in Israel as well. Um, I mentioned HP and kind of touched on them. That's actually one of the, the, pri the HP boycotts, one of the primary uh, uh, targets that I kind of have responsibility for as the North America uh, person for the BNC. Um, and then, but another thing we're really looking at right now that somewhat uh, bridges uh, these areas of focus is the U.S.-Mexico border um, and where there are common targets in terms of who is who are getting con who already have contracts on the border um, for border militarization um, that are common targets and who are getting new contracts in this era of a threatened wall uh, expansion by Trump. Um, so two of those corporations are, are you may not have heard of. One is Elbit, um, an Israeli uh, weapons corporation that is uh, prim like specializes in surveillance. They um, have a $145 million contract in Arizona and actually just got a new contract in Texas to build surveillance towers along the border, part of this whole virtual uh, kind of wall aspect uh, of the border. Uh, and many of those towers are being constructed on indigenous land, on reservation land um, of the Tonotan people um, in southern Arizona, a, a nation whose traditional lands have actually been bisected by the border. Um, and then more recently, a corporation called ELTA, which is a subsidiary of Israel Aerospace Industries, one of the largest weapons manufacturers in Israel, um, who just got one of the eight prototype contracts to build prototypes of Trump's wall um, and very eagerly uh, took that on. Um, and just, I will just uh, mention G4S, a corporation that many people have heard of, another one that has been involved in Standing Rock, um, is involved uh, in, is actually runs the buses that deport people, has the, the ICE contract for all uh, uh, transportation of deportations, um, and many, many other things around the world. Um, they're the largest security corporation on the planet, um, third largest employer on the planet, largest employer on the continent of Africa. Um, bad, bad, bad actor everywhere they are, another priority contract because um, they train Israeli police. And then uh, lastly, I will just say Jewish, the Jewish Voice for Peace campaign, uh, Deadly Exchange, which is really, uh, which is a new campaign focused, as other people have mentioned, on police training and police militarization and the exchange of worst practices between the US and Israel uh, amongst security forces that goes on very commonly. Um, and. Uh, I'm going a little bit over, but the last thing I will just say is that even as we win these campaigns, it's very important to keep an eye on what comes next. Um, just to name that in the 80s, um, when US-sponsored wars in Central America became so bad, so much torture, so much human rights violations that even the US Congress had to start to put limits on US aid, Israel was there to step in and supply those weapons and training to the, the, the right-wing governments in Central America. And so even as the, the US war machine is shrank through this campaign, it's very important to look at other weapons manufacturers, including the state of Israel, um, for where they may be stepping in to fill that gap worldwide. Thank you very much.